Hello everybody, Dr. Lloyd here. This is Anatomy and Physiology 1 lecture. We are going to review chapter 2 this morning. Beforehand, I uh, just want to go through what we do each week. So each week these videos are sent out through Canvas. Um, so this week will be chapters 2 and 3. And then during notes, take, or I'm sorry, during class, taking notes, completing homeworks two and three, and quizzes two and three. That's what this week is about. Okay, so chapter two, chemistry comes alive. Let's go through this, a lot of information. All right. So the, uh, the aims in this chapter uh, are to learn the basic chemistry and biochemistry of cells. And uh, we're going to learn about matter and atoms, um, mixtures and uh, chemical bonds, organic and inorganic compounds. Um, and looks like we're looking at proteins and carbohydrates and lipids and nucleic acids. Okay, so energy is a capacity to do work or put matter into motion. It doesn't have any mass, nor does it take up space. So the, the greater the work done, the more energy it takes. And there's kinetic versus potential energy. Kinetic is the energy in action, energy in motion. Potential is stored or inactive energy. And energy can be transformed from potential to kinetic. Stored energy can be released resulting in action. So the different forms of energy, there's chemical energy, which is stored in bonds, electrical energy, uh, resulting from the movement of charged particles, mechanical energy, which is uh, directly involved in moving matter, and radiant or electromagnetic energy, which travels in waves like heat and light and x-rays. Energy may be converted from one form to another, uh, and this energy conversion is usually inefficient. So a lot of energy is lost as heat. Now all matter is composed of elements. There are four elements that make up 96% of the body. This is carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Those are the main elements, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen. There are then various other elements that make up about 4% and another group that make up about less than 0.1%. So all elements are made up of atoms, which are unique building blocks. They're the smallest, uh, they're the smallest division of matter. And there's the atomic symbol. This table shows just what we are made of, the uh, human body composition, but 65% oxygen, surprisingly, 18.5% uh, carbon, that was a little lower than I thought, uh, hydrogen around 10% and nitrogen around 3.2%. So we're mainly made of, of oxygen uh, and carbon. There are other ions uh, like calcium, um, potassium, sodium, we're going to get to these, but these make up a, a, you know, a lesser amount of body mass. And then finally, some trace elements like chromium, cobalt, copper, zinc, uh, that, that make up uh, just a fraction of our body. So matter exists in uh, four forms, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. And the elements are uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Switch these. So the atoms are made up of three subatomic particles, the proton, neutron, and electron. Protons carry a positive charge and an arbitrary one AMU unit. Neutrons uh, have no electrical charge, but also weigh what protons do, so they have one AMU. Electrons carry a negative charge, 
uh, have virtually no weight and they are moving very fast. So there are two different models that can help to explain uh, these particles. There's a the planetary model and the orbital model. So the planetary is a simplified model, but it's quite outdated because it incorrectly depicts the orbitals. The orbital model uh, is our current model. Uh, it's probable region where electron is located um, rather than fixed orbits, but I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. Okay, so here we go. So here's the orbital model. Uh, represents electrons as a cloud of negative charge. Uh, in the middle we've got our two protons um, in red and our two neutrons in yellow. And so this electron out here is, is spinning around very fast, taking up this much space. Uh, the planetary model is much more simple. It shows the electrons um, in a shell, a specific orbit, which um, is definitely not the case. So this is for helium. Helium has uh, an atomic mass of two, uh, well, I'm sorry, of, of, uh, of four, atomic number of two. Okay. All right, so hydrogen has one proton, zero neutrons, and, and one electron. Helium has two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. Lithium has three, four, and three. So the identifying facts about an element include its atomic mass, the mass number, isotopes, and atomic weight. So it's important to know the electrons are orbiting and they're in electron clouds. Um, the neutrons and protons are at the nucleus of this atom. So chemical elements are composed of units of matter of the same atom type. Atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. Atomic mass, however, is the protons plus the neutrons, and they both have a uh, very similar weight. So carbon, the atomic number is six for the six protons they've got, and the atomic mass is 12 for uh, adding in the six neutrons, so six neutrons, six protons. It could be 13 because there are isotopes, but we'll, uh, we'll take that in a second. Oops. Okay. This looks familiar, I've looked at it already. All right, so radioisotopes are isotopes that decompose to more stable forms. And uh, there's decay, and, and when, when there's decay, there's some radioactivity that's released. This can be detected with various machines. And so radioisotopes are a valuable tool for biological research and medicine. But all radioactivity can damage tissue. So whatever exposure we have has to be short and uh, very focused. Okay, then we move on to molecules. Molecules, a uh, general term for two or more atoms bonded together. Now a compound is a specific molecule that has two or more different kinds of atoms bonded. So example of a compound would be C6H12O6, which is glucose. Other examples of molecules are H2 or O2. Then matter can exist as mixtures, which are two or more components. Uh, there can be solutions, colloids, or suspensions. Solutions, uh, the solute particles are very tiny. They do not settle down. They do not scatter light. Colloids. Uh, also, do not settle out, so if you leave it, it's not like it collects on the bottom, but it does scatter light. And so you have these, uh, these particles that will, uh, like, like this jello, uh, that changes the property of light. The third one is the suspension. Now, if you let this sit on the bench, it will settle out, and it, it may scatter light, depending on if you've just stirred it up or not. An example of a suspension is blood. So you let it settle, 
uh, you've got your different um, uh, red cells, then uh, plasma. So the solvent is the substance present in greatest amount, usually a liquid, liquid such as water. A solute is what's dissolved in the solvent. For example, glucose is a solute in uh, the blood plasma. There are various ways to express concentration. You can express them as um, milligrams per, per deciliter. It could be in molar. Uh, the molarity talks about the molecular weight and takes into account Avogadro's number. It's an interesting calculation. So colloids are also known as emulsions. So they're heterogeneous mi mixtures, which is, uh, this is there are separate layers and the particles are not evenly distributed. Suspensions are heterogeneous mixtures that contain large visible solutes that do settle out. So suspensions are gonna settle out, whereas uh, colloids are not. And we talked about how blood is considered a suspension. Okay, a couple differences. Mixtures do not involve chemical bonds between components. Mixtures can be separated by physical means like straining, filtering. Mixtures can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. Compounds are only homogeneous. Chemical bonds are energy relationships between electrons of reacting atoms. So the chemical bonds are not actual physical structures, but they determine uh, in many times the chemistry of that molecule or compound. So electrons, um, if we look at simplified models, there, there can be shells that hold a specific number of uh, electrons and the shell one holds two electrons, the second shell holds eight electrons, a third shell holds 18 electrons. Now this outer shell, provided it's one of these, is called your valence shell. Now the valence electrons are the ones that are going to be furthest from the nucleus and the ones that will be involved in chemical reactions. If you talk about oxidation, reduction, losing, gaining electrons, it's going to be this outer shell. So it, that is your valence shell. Atoms desire eight electrons in their valence shell. The exception is the first shell, which is two. Now most atoms don't have a full valence shell. So they'll gain, lose, share electrons uh, to become more stable. Some uh, elements are chemically inert in, in that their outer shell is full. And so this one, the first shell is two. Helium has got uh, atomic number of two, atomic mass of four. The, uh, it, it's not charged in its noble gas form. So we've got two electrons. It's got a full outer shell, which means it's non-reactive. It is inert. Same with neon uh, outer shell. We're supposed to have eight electrons. We've got eight electrons. It's happy. It's not going to react. It's not going to gain electrons. It's not going to lose electrons. These are our noble gases. Now, there are other elements that are reactive. Hydrogen, with its one electron, can, can lose that electron. Carbon, with its four electrons, uh, it's going to um, try to lose or gain. Oxygen, it's got its seven electrons, so it's got one electron short of eight. So oxygen is, they, they really want that electron. Uh, it makes it what's called electronegative. And sodium it just has one electron in its valence shell. You can see this last shell. And so it can donate 
this electron pretty readily. So an ion is an atom that has lost or gained an electron. So we've got sodium fluoride here, which is salts. Okay, we've got sodium, which is with its one valence electron, chloride with its seven valence electrons. So chloride is really electronegative. It really wants this electron uh, so that it can be happy, and it forms uh, what's called an ionic bond. Now, a molecule is two or more atoms sharing electrons. A compound is a substance that can be broken down into two more different elements. All compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. So I will explain that. But a molecule would be um, H2, I'm sorry, O2, whereas a compound could be H2O. It's got two different elements. That's what makes it a compound. But the compound is a molecule. This molecule is not a compound because it doesn't have two or more elements, different elements. So there are three types of chemical bonds. There's ionic, covalent, and hydrogen. So ionic bonds are when atoms gain or lose electrons and they become charged. So when you gain an electron, you become an anion. When you lose an electron, you become a cation. Anions are negatively charged, cations are positively charged. There's another type of bond called covalent bonds where the electrons are shared between the two uh, atoms. And so you can have sharing of two electrons resulting in a single bond, sharing of four electrons resulting in a double bond, or sharing of six electrons resulting in a triple bond. So we've got hydrogen atoms, uh, four of them plus one carbon. carbon wants to have four uh, electrons to complete its valence shell, and so it bonds with hydrogen four times and produces methane, or CH4. Two oxygens uh, react together to uh, share four electrons in total, so it forms a double bond, whereas nitrogen comes together and forms a triple bond. Now the covalent bonds can have a couple different flavors. One of them is called nonpolar covalent. It's when they're equally sharing the electrons. So you've got two oxygens and one carbon in the middle, and on either side, you've got two uh, double bonds representing four electrons each being shared. And this is a linear molecule. It's uh, a little bit larger around the carbon than the oxygens, but it's symmetrical. It's nonpolar, which means there are no poles to it. Polar covalents are the unequal distribution of electrons. And this results in partial positive charges of the molecule. And that could be, that could affect the electronegativity, electropositivity. So we talk about water. Water looks really like CO2, except for it's got this bulge. So it's got this, uh, delta minus, which means partial minus, uh, delta positive, delta positive. So we've got partial positive charges and partial minus charges because the, the uh, electrons here, these free electrons, are pushing the atoms down. And so you end up with a polar group where you have partial charges. So water is polar covalent, carbon dioxide is nonpolar covalent, sodium chloride is ionic. 
So hydrogen bonds, uh, these are attractive forces between the electropositive hydrogen and the electronegative oxygen. Okay, so these are not true bonds. They're more of a weak magnetic attraction. And th we have such amazing properties of water which allow for life. And these hydrogen bonds are a major factor for that. So here we've got hydrogen bonding between different polar molecules. So we've got our molecule here with our partial negative and our partial positive charges. Well, the partial positive charge is attracted to the partial negative charge of a subsequent molecule. This partial positive charge to this partial negative, this partial negative to this partial positive. And so uh, there's organization of these water molecules due to the hydrogen bonding. And this is what allows uh, surface tension to develop. And then we, we have a little niche here uh, with this organism being able to walk on the water, but it's because of the surface tension. Uh, the hydrogen bonding is, is providing cohesion so the water molecules stick together. So in chemical equations, you've got reactants, usually on the left side, and products, usually on the right side. And they're usually in balanced equations. So uh, here's an example, two hydrogen uh, reacting to produce hydrogen gas, H2. Or uh, we talked about this earlier, four hydrogen and one carbon come together to make methane. So the first would be a synthesis reaction where we're forming larger molecules. This would be also uh, an anabolic process. Anabolic uh, is a building process, part of metabolism. So here we've got uh, amino acids forming peptide bonds and a uh, polypeptide chain. So this is synthesis reaction. There's also the opposite, a catabolic or bond breaking reaction where you take glycogen, uh, you break it down into its monomer, which would be glucose. So let's say that you're running a marathon, you need to have more uh, sugar to burn. You take your stored glycogen, it breaks down into glucose, then this glucose is, is taken up and broken down for energy. There are exchange reactions. And so uh, you can look at these uh, like A plus, A, A, B plus C goes to A, C plus B or A, B plus C, D goes to A, D plus C, B. So there are a number of different displacement reactions, but one of the uh, more clear ones is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This is the cellular energy that we use. Uh, it's got uh, three different phosphates on it, um, and there are exchange reactions where this phosphate can then go onto a glucose, and so that would be glucose phosphate, and so we've exchanged the molecule uh, for a different, uh, we've exchanged from one molecule to the next. Now atoms are reduced when they gain electrons. They're oxidized when they lose electrons. So we've got an example of uh, glucose, C6H12O6, plus 6O2 goes to 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus ATP. This looks strikingly familiar, like uh, uh, cellular respiration, which undergoes in the mitochondrion. Um, in this case, glucose is oxidized and oxygen is reduced. So we've got glucose here. It's oxidized into CO2 and water. Where is your oxygen? is reduced, so it's, it, so it's gaining, uh, I'm sorry, it's losing electrons uh, as it becomes uh, CO2. So we got a reduction, which is a gain of electrons, and an oxidation, which is a loss of electrons. Now, if you're next to an oxygen, that's actually where it comes from, oxygen loves to, to 
gather electrons. And so that's an oxidizer. Okay, two different reactions involving released energies. There's exergonic, is a net release of energy, and this could be as heat or potential energy. So both catabolic and oxidative reactions are exergonic, so the release of energy. There's endergonic, which is the absorption of energy. Many anabolic reactions are endergonic. So they will actually take the energy from the reaction. The reaction might cool down. There is chemical equilibri equilibrium between these reactions. And so A plus B goes to AB, and AB can dissociate to A plus B. Not all reactions are reversible, though. They might need a little bit of help. Okay, the speed of chemical reactions can be affected by the temperature, the concentration of the reactants, and the particle size. So the smaller the particle, the increased rate. It can just zip around faster. The concentration. The more concentration, uh, the increased rate of the reaction. And temperature. The increased temperature usually increases the rate of the reaction. And then there are catalysts which increase the rate of the reaction without being chemically changed or becoming part of the product. So there are enzymes which are biological catalysts. So they're not used up in the reaction, but they do help the reaction. Inorganic and organic compounds. So inorganic are non-carbon containing compounds like water salts, acids, and bases. Organic compounds contain carbon. That's the definition of organic. So carbohydrates, fats, lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and nucleic acids, excuse me. These contain carbon, are usually large, usually covalent bonded, but both of them are, are necessary for life. So most abundant inorganic compounds account for about 60 to 80 percent of the volume of living cells. And they have various properties like high heat capacity, high heat of vaporization, polar solvent, reactivity, cushioning. Let's see what we can uh, talk about here. So high heat capacity is ability to absorb and release heat with little temperature change. High heat of vaporization. Uh, uh, evaporation requires a large amount of heat. Polar solvents, we talked a little bit about water, how it's polar. Uh, these form hydration shells because of their, uh, well, around uh, different salts because of the charges. Water's got its, its partial negative charge, so you can see the partial negative uh, oxygens are um, uh, bonding with this uh, sodium, which has, uh, which is missing uh, an electron. And so it definitely wants to gain that electron. So dissoci dissociation of salt and water revolves the hydration shells or surrounding wa water surrounding the salt. Okay, reactivity necessary for uh, synthesis reactions. Um, all right, so talk about salts a little bit. So all salts are called electrolytes because they can conduct uh, electrical currents in solution. So common salts are sodium chloride, potassium chloride, calcium carbonate. Uh, acids and bases are both electrolytes. Um, they ionize and dissociate in water. Acids are proton donors bases or proton acceptors. And the pH scale. So this is a scale between uh, 0 and 14. It's not a linear scale. It's a logarithmic scale. So each change is a factor of 10. The pH scale is measurement of concentration of hydrogen 
ions in a solution. The more hydrogen, the more acidic it is. So uh, that would be on the acidic side, which would be towards the zero. So once again, each unit of pH represents a tenfold difference. So a pH of five is 10 times more acidic than a pH of six and so on. So acidic solutions have a high level of um, hydrogens, but these are actually protons, um, and low pH. Alkaline solutions are basic, and these have low protons but high pH. So uh, low pH would be hydrochloric acid, lemon juice, wine, coffee. High pH would be sodium hydroxide, oven cleaner, ammonia, bleach. And then neutral would be blood, milk, egg whites. There are neutralization reactions where water is produced. So these two uh, compounds, sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, uh, when mixed together, neutralize and form water. That's why you should never add an acid and a base together because they will just uh, get wasted um, in the production of water uh, and then there goes your acids and there goes your bases. So buffers resist changes in pH So we've got uh, bicarbonate here, um, which can dissociate to release this proton when it's, when it's necessary. So uh, at a certain time, it can uh, donate a proton. And enzymes, which we uh, just barely touched on, have a specific pH range that they operate in, very narrow. So organic molecules contain carbon, and proteins are made up of uh, carbohydrates. Well, I'm sorry, not, not, not proteins. Most organic compounds are made up of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. These are the four types of biomolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Now, many of these are polymers, where they form polymers. So when they are in their monomer form, they come together and lose a water, which encourages a covalent bond. The opposite is true when you're hydrolyzing them. You would give water and it will split the molecules. Okay, here's an example. So we've got Monomer 1 and monomer 2, we do the lasso method where we lasso out H2O. Boom. And then we've got our, uh, looks like an ester linkage here, um, covalent bond. Uh, but the opposite is true. So let's take this linkage, uh, covalent bond. It's add a water. We split the water. And now we've got our monomers back. Of course, there are enzymes which help these processes. Um, Dehydration synthesis of glucose. You've got uh, glucose and fructose. We lasso out our H2O, boom. And we've got sucrose now with this covalent bond between glucose and fructose that makes sucrose. So this is dehydration synthesis. So let's talk about carbohydrates. Uh, carbohydrates contain a lot of C's, H's, and O's. And they're in a two to one ratio, hydrogen and oxygen, which means for every oxygen, there are about two hydrogens. And this, uh, you know, this, there's probably 10 oxygens and 20 hydrogens. Um, uh, in each molecule, there, there are many oxygens and hydrogens. There are three classes, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. So carbohydrates are usually sugars and starches. And, um, you know, glucose, for example, is a monosaccharide. It's a monomer, it's the smallest unit. It comes together. Uh, to form a disaccharide, uh, which would be two uh, glucoses, or it can form a whole string of them, uh, becoming a polysaccharide. 
so we've got an example done here. Glucose plus fructose uh, and galactose, uh, deoxyribose and ribose. These are all sugars. They're all monomers, so they're not bonded together. So it's got a ring structure with oxygen in the ring. Uh, it's, it's got um, carbon to hydrogen ratio of one to two. So it's got for every one carbon, there are two hydrogens. Um, these are monosaccharides. Okay, if we make a bond between glucose and fructose, we make sucrose. The glucose and fructose is maltose. Glucose and fructose can also be lactose, depending on what types of bonds are created. So these are all types of disaccharides, sucrose, maltose, and lactose. And then uh, we can con construct polysaccharides. This is all from dehydration synthesis. So polysaccharides would be like glycogen. Glycogen are, are linked monomers of glucose. And so you've got glucose, 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 linked together three or more. Okay, we talk about fats, triglycerides. Um, now, fats uh, can be solid or liquid at room temperature, and this can determine what their chemical properties are. But here we've got a glycerol backbone, and glycerol is really just half of glucose. Your dehydration synthesis, so you lasso out the H2O, and you've got this fatty acid chain and it forms eventually a triacyl glyceride. So these are your acyl groups. Uh, you get your glycerol backbone, you got three fatty acid chains. Now you can write them like this, C, 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 C. Or you can get a little lazy and write it like this with these lines. They both mean the same thing. Uh, the hydrogens are kind of assumed it's a simplified drawing, so you don't have to write all these letters out. Okay, so saturated. These are your lipids, which are solid at room temperature. And there's no double bonds in this fatty acid chain. You can see there's just single bonds. Double bonds would be two lines. And as a consequence, they stack really easily. And so one on the other, one on the other, they stack like, like little little pancakes, okay? And because they are, they form a denser structure, they are solid at room temperature. This would be like butter. When you introduce a bond in the fatty acid, it kinks the tail. So these are more fluid. They're not able to form solids at room temperature because of this kink in the fatty acid. This would be like olive oil. So phospholipids, they were very important, which make up membranes, have uh, a phosphate head, glycerol backbone, and fatty acid tails. This one's got an unsaturation here which means it's got a double bond, it's got a little kink. So we've got a polar molecule. So uh, you've got uh, the partial negative charges of the phosphate and then the non-charged fatty acid tails. So these are your non-polar group and your polar head group. And these come together via hydrophobic reactions, which we can talk about um, but hydrophobic uh, is water fearing or repelling. Hydrophilic is water attracting. So a hydrophilic group would be like the polar group, the polar head group. This would be in water.
okay? These fatty acid tails are gonna be kind of pushed together to form a little lipid area where water does not like to be. And so these uh, phospholipids come together to form membranes in my cells. And so you've got your polar head groups, your fatty acid tails. The fatty acid tails push together because of hydrophobic interaction and hydrophilic interaction allows the head group to be in the aqueous compartment, which would be the compartment with water. Then we have steroids. Steroids are still fats, but they're a little different structure. There are four interlocking hydrocarbon rings, so they've got this look to them. This happens to be cholesterol. But these are very important in membrane fluidity and other reactions. Okay, icosanoids, um, these are very important uh, fatty acids that uh, are prostaglandins and they play a role in blood clotting. They're pretty important. All right. Okay, let's look at protein function. We've got structural proteins, enzymatic proteins, transport, contractile, communicative, and defensive. Many different types of proteins. All proteins are made from 20 different amino acids, and they, uh, they combine to make peptide bonds via dehydration synthesis. And this is between the amine group, group and the acid group. So when we look at this amino acid here, we've got uh, NH2, CH, COOH, and then the R group. The R group represents one of 20 groups. So you've got your amino end here, the NH, and you've got your carboxyl end, the COH. So you lasso out the water, you've got your dipeptide, two amino acids together of the peptide bond. Now, uh, these polypeptides can form uh, linear sequences, that's a polypeptide, secondary sequences when they interact with, uh, with uh, each other. So you've got alpha helices, beta pleated sheets. You've got tertiary sequences, and this is secondary structure interact. And then quaternary, uh, how you know, different subgroups of proteins interact with another. So this is the primary structure showing the peptide bonds between these amino acids. Secondary structure showing alpha helices within a polypeptide. Um, then tertiary would be uh, the um, alpha helis or beta pleated sheet folded up in a nice organization. And then quaternary is when you have one or two, uh, two subunits of proteins that come together that function uh, as a whole. And so these can be fibrous or globular. Fibrous are structural proteins. Globular are uh, sensitive to changes in environmental conditions. Okay, denaturation is when the protein unfolds and loses its shape, will also lose its activity. And enzymes, these are proteins, they're globular proteins, they act as catalysts, so they speed up a chemical reaction. Enzymes are very specific, they act on a very specific substrate. And so if you look at the uh, energy versus progression of the reaction, we've got our reactants. There's an uphill climb, which means you need energy, you get to a certain plateau, and then you go downhill to produce your product. Well, this is called activation energy, the energy to activate uh, this reaction. The enzyme decreases the activation energy so that the reaction is more uh, readily accessible under the, under the current conditions. So these are the catalysts. So mechanism of enzyme action, you've got your enzyme with your active sites and your substrate. substrate 
fit, uh, fits into the specific active sites forming the enzyme substrate complex. This, this uh, let's say we're, we're forming uh, a polypeptide, we've got dehydration synthesis, which uh, forms that, that peptide bond. Um, then the uh, product is released, the enzyme um, is reusable to form another enzyme substrate complex. Okay, finally, nucleic acids composed of C's, H's, O's, N's, and P's. These are the largest. Uh, they're nucleotides. They form deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid, which we'll talk about. DNA is double-stranded. It's a double helix. And uh, there's uh, different nitrogenous bases and with rules like A always bonds with T, G always bonds with C. A is adenine, G is guanine, C is cytosine, T is thymine. That's for DNA. And so here we've got our, our two uh, alpha helices. This is our DNA. Then RNA. RNA is single-stranded. Um, and instead of containing deoxyribose, it contains just ribose. And instead of containing thymine, it contains uracil. So various RNAs, messenger RNA, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA. So here's the structure of ATP. You've got uh, adenosine, ribose, sugar, and phosphate groups. And so uh, adenosine would be adenine and ribose. Uh, adenosine monophosphate would be plus one. Adenosine diphosphate plus two. Adenosine triphosphate plus three. This is uh, adenosine triphosphate. Okay. That's your energy source. Now ATP can lose a uh, inorganic phosphate for the and, and the release of energy. This is how reactions happen. Okay, different uh, work. There is uh, transport work, mechanical work, and chemical work, uh, and we'll talk about each one of these but it looks like this is the last slide. Okay, so we're gonna get into this the next chapter. We're gonna get into the different types of cellular work. Okay, great, I will see you guys uh, Saturday and see you tomorrow for the second video, take care.